Hello. Uh, hello, how are you? Hope Very you are good, doing thanks. How are you? well. So today, inshallah, uh, Dr. Okay, so I will start for today. We okay. have four main agendas. First, me and Dr. Riham will present the power of care and the elderly. After that, there is a dental group. They will present a very interesting topic, overall manifestation of gastrointestinal diseases. They are Dr. Asma. Uh, and also Dr. Namarik. For the third part, I hope it will be a very interesting presentation. It will be the electronic health record or medical records by Dr. Fathir Rahman and Dr. Sylvia. The fourth part is uh, mock interview sessions. Dr. Amal, Hadar, and Noha will be, um, we will ask them and they will answer. Okay, and 10 minutes in the end for projects update if we have any. Okay, so Dr. Riham, you can now start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shema. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. I hope everybody's enjoying their Saturday relaxing. Uh, okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, this topic has been mainly prepared by Dr. Shema and uh, myself uh, under the supervision of Dr. Nader. The goals of this presentation for today is uh, quickly review the diagnosis of the intestinal uh, disorders, uh, namely fecaloma, uh, fecal incontinence and constipation. And then I'll take you quickly through the risk factors and then we move on to the distinction between uh, const uh, like constipation objectively and uh, subjectively, and lastly, the treatment of all constipation, fecal incontinence, and fecaloma. So this topic uh, is really important because intestinal disorders are frequent and they involve significant morbidity and they cost highly in their diagnosis and the treatment. Um, not to mention that it's a painful problem to begin with. So a prompt care and appropriate therapy is mandatory. Now, um, intestinal disorders usually uh, become uh, more common as we age, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's related to medication. Um, chronic constipation by itself, uh, like 40% of chronic constipation by itself are mostly related to medication mainly polypharmacy. Uh, and this uh, diseases, these disorders, if not treated, they can result in serious complications. Now, uh, what concerns uh, us here, the, the geriatric complication, uh, the geriatric population, sorry, uh, the frail elderly, they have uh, issues reporting the symptoms, either because of communication or cognitive impairment, impairment in rectal sensation, uh, non-specific symptoms such as um, what we, that we encounter among them with delirium, anorexia, and functional decline. Okay, so constipation by itself um, is prevalent. Now, my main focus here, like the, the coming few minutes, is going to be about constipation. So constipation by itself is a very common functional bowel disorder. Uh, among the elderly population, it can be up to 30%. And in the long-term health facilities, incidents rise to above 90%. Risk factors for constipation among this age, I mean, this population, that constipation and laxative use increases with age. It's not only common among the elderly. It's common among only, I mean. It's common among women, Blacks, and people of low socioeconomic level. And the youngsters have their share of it if their lifestyle is inactive, if there's decrease in caloric intake, generally speaking, low fiber diet, decrease in fluid, and of course, uh, polypharmacy. Uh, am I following the slides, Dr. Shema? Because I can't see the slides. I don't know why. Yes, you are. Okay. So by definition, constipation can be defined as decreasing frequency of bowel movements to less than three per week, a report of difficult evacuation, painful passage of heart stool, uh, sensation of incomplete evacuation as well. Now, Dr. Shema, can we jump to three slides? Because I want to take them to the Rome 4 criteria, because it basically defines the uh, functional constipation in adults. 
So it's another definition for constipation. Yes, you go on. Thank you very much. So uh, the criteria for Rome criteria, uh, it has to fulfill for the last three months with symptoms onset at least six months prior to diagnosis. And this criteria must contain two of the following. So two is enough among all these. Strain in during more than 25% of defecation, lumpy or hard stool, more than 25% of defecation. Now, hard stools uh, or lumpy is defined based on Bristol stool form, which uh, Dr. Shema kindly shared on the, using this diagram. So a Bristol stool, if you can see on this uh, diagram, on the far uh, left of this diagram, uh, you've got seven types of stool. Basically, it's the consistency and the functional constipation. There's no pain. And basically, type 1 and type 2 form the functional constipation with pellet form or just small pieces of hard stool. Another uh, uh, criteria is sensation of incomplete evacuation for more than 25% of defecation, sensation of anorectal obstruction slash blockage for more than 25% of defecations, manual maneuver to facilitate more than 25% of defecations fewer than three spontaneous bowel movement per week. Now, based on literature, two more points. Loose stools are rarely present without the use of laxatives. That can also be in the other criteria. And lastly, insufficient criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. It can go into the functional constipation definition. Okay, let's jump back to the constipation uh, after the definition. We've got primary causes and we've got secondary causes. Primary causes is, are basically decrease in fluid intake, decrease in fiber, fluid, and ineffective peristalsis and evacuation by Valsalva. And the secondary causes, they can be um, prescription medications. I mean, generally speaking, prescription medications, neurologic, myopathic, endocrine, physiologic, sorry, psychologic, and structural abnormalities, as well as medication. So on this table, the green table, table two, uh, common medications are antacids, especially with calcium, are in supplements and opioids. Less common medications are anticholinergics, antipsychotics, and diuretics to name few. Medical conditions, the most common are cerebrovascular disease, depression, diabetes, mellitus, hypothyroidism, and irritable bowel syndrome. And to less uh, extent, lesser extent, we've got anal fissures, um, colon cancer, multiple sclerosis, and spinal cord injury, again, to name a few. And uh, so basically the next slide is the secondary causes that I've mentioned most of them. And the following slide is the medication. And again, they've been mentioned. Okay, now with regard to how we diagnose constipation, a detailed history and a thorough physical examination are the basis for initial evaluation of patient complaint and of constipation. There's also rectal exploration. This is essential and should aim to assess the anal tone the presence of any mass, uh, skin condition, rectal prolapse, state of the pelvic floor, um, all these may, anything that suggests neurological problem. And we all have always to bear in mind the red flags. So any patients with red flags above the age of 50, um, we can use a colonoscopy for the diagnosis. And um, we've got abdominal x-ray in the fasted uh, patient. Uh, it's still questioned. The utility of abdominal x-ray uh, is still questioned. All right. Now, the um, AGA, the American G Gastroenterology Association Consensus Guideline, recommends full blood count, uh, glucose, TSH, calcium, creatinine, colonoscopy uh, in patients above the age of 50 with rectal bleeding or significant weight loss. And then we've got the... Uh, transient time, anorectal manometry, and balloon expulsions. All these are modalities for the diagnosis of the various uh, presentation of constipation. And then moving on to the prevention of constipation, it basically focuses on the conditioned reflex. And this can be done through establishing a toileting schedule, which is usually um, interfered by social or rehabilitative and medication regimens. 
So um, the patient simply is asked to avoid on certain times during the day and night. And then encourage the patient for uh, fluid intake of at least 1500 mLs per day. And of course, physical activity and exercise, uh, all of which should improve colonic transit time. And then uh, moving on to the treatment, treatment of constipation. Um, patients respond to conservative therapy, usually. And the aim of treatment here is to relieve the symptoms and not raising the frequency of bowel movement per week. Initial management includes high fiber diet, increased water intake and exercise. It can be divided into three. We can use the biofeedback, we can use stool softeners, laxatives, enemas, and subsidiaries, and of course, dietary fibers. The combination of uh, natural fiber, fruit juices, and natural laxative mixtures are often advocated in clinical practices because they eventually increase the bowel frequency and decrease laxative use among elderly. In the treatment of constipation, we have uh, four, four main types of laxatives. We've got the bulk laxatives, and basically they're soluble products or insoluble. We've got the emollient laxatives, like the cusates and mineral oils, osmotic, uh, osmotic laxatives, such as magnesium, like telose and the PEC, and lastly, stimulus such as uh, Senna Pesacudil. The bulk laxatives, basically, they are hydrophilic. They absorb water from the intestinal lumen and then eventually increase and soften fecal mass. To name a few, the soluble ones are like psyllium, uh, pectin, and insoluble ones such as cellulose. Stimulants, basically, they increase intestinal motility and water secretion into the lumen, and this boosts peristalsis. The only drawback is that it might may cause cramps. As for soft, uh, stool softeners and emollient laxatives, um, decusates decreases the surface tension so water enters the bowel more easily. It is well controlled, but it's less effective than fibers. And it may be useful in patients with anal fissures or hemorrhoids. Mineral oils such as paraffin is usually not recommended on account of risk of aspiration. And then it binds liposoluble vitamins, the addicts and the intestinal lumen reducing their absorption and then eventually deficiencies develop. Osmotic laxatives, um, Magnesium hydroxide or citrate, they, are, they cause electrolyte imbalance. That's the problem. And then they can result in hypokalemia, salt water retention, and diarrhea. This must be employed with care in patients with cardiovascular disease or chronic renal insufficiency. Lactulose splits into short chain fatty chain acids by intestinal flora. And this is the problem. It would cause flatulence and worsening of symptoms. So it's not really favorable. And then the PEG is an unmetabolized uh, substance by the intestinal flora. It does not cause bloating. It has a high molecular weight, so it's poorly absorbed, and it does not interact with other medications and does not give rise to tolerance. And uh, lupibristone activates chloride channels, increasing fluid secretion. It is approved by the FDA, reduces straining and softens stools, also increases the number of, the bowel, of bowel movements. It's well to tolerated, but with regards to the elderly, it needs further investigations. Lastly, suppositories and enemas like glycerine, bisacudyl, phosphate, they still play a major role, especially for patients with difficulty in evacuation. And of course, we have to talk about opioid-induced constipation. Now, to diagnose a patient with an opioid-induced constipation, it has to be a new or worsening symptoms of constipation when initiating, changing, or increasing opioid therapy, that must include two or more of the following. Straining during more than 25% of the defecations, lumpy or hard stools, again, based on the uh, Bristol criteria, sensation of incomplete evacuation for more than 25%, and sensation of uh, anorectal obstruction blockage, more than 25%, manual maneuvers, uh, to facilitate more than 25% of defecations, and then fewer than three small bowel movements per week. So it's more or less like the wrong criteria, right? From four criteria. 
And then, of course, those tools are rarely present without the use of laxatives. The problem with opioid-induced constipation, it decreases the quality of life and decreases the beneficial effect for why it has been used in the first place, right? So we use it to, to reduce the pain, but then it comes with um, side effects. Older adults are more likely to develop opioid-induced constipation compared with younger patients. Reasons for this higher incidence may include age-related physiological changes at the GI tract. This population uh, suffered delayed gastric emptying, decreased GI blood flow, and slow GI transit. Also, the comorbidities in polypharmacy reduce physical activity and the low fluid and fiber intake. Difficulty reaching the bathroom or inadequate time and privacy to defecate. And also, such factors, especially prevalent in the geriatric patient, reside in long-term care facilities. And lastly, uh, a preventable adverse effect. Um, we can do this by non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic prophylaxis. The World Health Organization and the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine recommended prophylactic laxative regimens in cancer or terminally ill receiving opioid. They recommend that it should be explorated to all patients receiving opioid therapy unless there is a clear contraindication to laxative use. Many experts recommend combination therapy with a stimulant laxative and stool softener to increase GI tract motility and to soften stools for the comfortable evacuation. And by this, I reach to the end of my piece of this presentation. I'll hand it to Dr. Shaima. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Liham. This was a great presentation. Please allow me to take from here. So going forth uh, to fecal incontinence, this is, as uh, from its name, is accidental, unintentional loss of stool, either in liquid or solid form. And there is anal incontinence if also gas uh, passes without the intent of the patient. 30% of the cases are associated with stroke, which, as we know, uh, has a great incidence in the elderly population. We also have to differentiate between urgency and incontinence. So urgency, the patient will sense the urge of, being, of having pieces in the rectum, but he cannot contain them while going to the bathroom. And this is more frequent in cases of inflammation of either the rectum or the colon or infectious diarrheal diseases. Uh, it could reach 7% in the elderly, but uh, same as constipation, the incidence and prevalence increased a lot when they are institutionalized. It's usually underestimated because patients uh, will be shy from reporting that they have incontinence. So they may actually say they have diarrhea. So this is a point that must be buried in mind when you're taking history from your patients. So incontinence, um, on anatomical or physiological levels will depend on different factors. The sensation of the patient, does he have sensation in the anal erectile region? In the rectal compliance, can it uh, distend and relax appropriately? The sphincter muscle and nerve function, after he feels it, can he control it? The consistency and volume of the stool, if the stool is very voluminous and it's very fluidy, maybe the normal person cannot contain it. Um, and also the patient mental state, is he aware, uh, is he conscious, is he delirious so that he can tell us or if he can control it or not. So con incontinence will have numerous causes depending on these um, factors relying on the continence. For example, diabetic neuropathy can affect the sensory, the motor nerves, and, or even on the long run will cause atrophy of the muscles due to motor neuropathy. Neurological diseases like dementia and stroke, and for example, uh, disc, disc uh, bulges compressing the nerves. Abnormal rectal compliance, for example, due to ischemia in this region and MVO, the patient will have weak muscle and weak compliance of the rectal muscles. The pelvic floor dysfunction, for example, the patient has very loose sphincters uh, sphincter problems, fecaloma, which is we will come to it in a few minutes. It's a very big mass of stool that is uh, that the patient cannot evacuate by himself. And for the last point is proctitis. Please note that both diarrhea and constipation are independent risk factors for fecal incontinence. So the patient may be constipated and still have incontinence, 
or may have diarrhea and incontinence together. So for the treatment, we usually try to treat by using antidiarrheal drugs because it's easier to control a front stool passage than to, uh, to control um, a fluid stool or a liquid form stool. So um, two, of, uh, two of the treatment that we use are opioids. The first is lopiramide, it's synthetic opioid. It has an excellent safety profile because it does not cross the blood brain barrier. So we, we do not expect it to cause euphoria and does not cause dependence. It will also reduce the urgency if the patient has any, will decrease the stool volume and allow the mucosa to have more contact uh, with the food particles so that it will have greater water absorption and the, uh, the stool will be more formed. Main side effects of the course, uh, like we said, opioid induced constipation, but constipation for these patients uh, is better tolerated than incontinence because of dignity, because they can tolerate having constipation, but they cannot tolerate having incontinence. Second drug is diphenoxylate. Actually, it passes the blood brain barrier, so it may cause mild euphoria. So, use for the long run is not preferred. And the same as any opioid, excessive use will lead to constipation. Other drugs, but actually are not preferred in elderly due to the broad spectrum of side effects, is amitriptyline. It's tricyclic, it has anticholinergic, serotonergic, antimuscarinic properties. Um, it can be used in patients with idiopathic fecal incontinence, but for the elderly, we, and according to the peers criteria, we usually try not to use them. Some studies um, reported that biofeedback, whatever uh, the cause of the fecal incontinence, may be used in motivated patients who can sense their sphincter and can contract it, but um, maybe may reach up to 40% success in motivated patients. The second topic I want to talk about is fecal oma. From its name, oma means a mass, so it's a fecal mass in the bowel of these patients. It's a frequent complication of constipation, especially uh, on, in the elderly who do not have the capacity to evacuate a lot and go to the bathroom freely. Uh, it can paradoxically manifest with diarrhea because the more liquid stool will pass uh, the fecal mass, so it will present with diarrhea sometimes. Heart feces are mainly present in the distal colon, so they will present with pain, incontinence, sometimes with obstruction, confusion, and even ulcers. These ulcers are actually can be fatal and are usually diagnosed post-mortem. And 4% of operations for colonic perforation are due to these ulcers from the fecalomas. These heart feces may also build up uh, up to the proximal rectum. By rectal exploration, we will find no masses because it will not view the proximal rectum, but we can see um, on abdominal x-ray a fecal mass. So let's see. This is an x-ray that shows us a fecaloma. As you can see, all this area is one big fecal mass. Uh, it's even dense because um, due to the chronicity of the condition, it has some calcifications from the food particles and protein particles. So it will appear very dense, and very large. You can even sometimes be mistaken and think it's a vulvulus. And the CT below, there's also a cut section of the bulbous. You can see um, the sigmoid or the rectum. Uh, it's very distended with fecal matter. All of these particles are fecal matter. It's compressing the urinary bladder so the patient may actually present with urinary incontinence. So what do we do? Um, we can do physiological tests, but they will usually be normal. There is no rectal dysenergy. There is no inappropriate contractions. The muscles are actually normal or were normal, but a bit stretched. We will take history and do detailed examination. Of course, if you palpate the abdomen of such a patient, you will find this big mass or the abdominal distension. So history and examination is usually enough to elicit a diagnosis in 85% of the cases. We can also go further and do neurologic tests on our patient to see if he has a chronic constipation that led to the development of fecaloma. Uh, sometimes we'll use tumoidoscopy or colonoscopy to evacuate all this fecal matter and to check if there is any associated inflammation because all of this fecal matter can cause inflammation to the bowel. So the main safe treatment is um, to remove the fecaloma and to prevent its recurrence. So we, will, we may need, like I said, endoscopy or repeated enemas, especially if it's high in the rectum. 
And to prevent recurrence, we'll usually give anti-constipation medication, maybe glycerin suppositories or uh, polyethylene glycol, which is more safe in elderly. Also, we can um, go over the drugs and medication that the patient is taking and make sure that none of them can cause constipation or at least decrease them. And sometimes uh, prescribing, uh, we can prescribe anti-diarrheal medication if no clear cause can be found. The elderly would prefer to use a toilet rather than a commode and it must be clear. And uh, they would usually need help, especially in institutions. Uh, so the nurses or the institutionalized staff must be, be able to be motivated and help the elderly when front for, and ask for help to keep, them, uh, to keep their dignity and privacy, to close the doors, to provide assistance when needed and control the noise and odors because this is very embarrassing for all patients. Uh, toilets also must be designed to be able to support the patient's upper body and be stable. To be stable means to be a toilet that is fixed in the floor and to be able to support the upper body so that the patient can uh, have something to hang on or stand with when needed. It also must be batted to prevent the cubitus ulcers from prolonged sitting and have enough space to be able to clean because the elderly will have um, sometimes weak musculature of the body, will have um, difficult maneuvering themselves. This is the references and this is the end of our uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, both uh, Dr. Reham and Dr. Shema. Uh, this is excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, it's common in older patients and here in the US, when I see patients in the nursing home, sometimes we come across these cases. So it's better to know what you are dealing with or what they uh, complain. Excellent. Any questions, uh, guys? anyone has any questions, please either unmute yourself or write in the chat. Okay, thank you, everybody. Now we can go to our next uh, agenda portion, which is oral manifestation of GI disease. Please go on. I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Shema. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Asma. Uh, today, Dr. Namarik and mm -hmm. I will present for you the oral manifestation of GIT disorder. So let me share my screen. Sorry for the delay. Did you see my screen? Yes, clear. Okay. So hi everyone. Uh, today um, I'm uh, with you, uh, with Dr. me and Dr. Namara will present the oral manifestation of GIT disorder. Start. The lesions within the jaw and oral mucosa or pre-oral tissues may sometimes be seen as manifestation of gastrointestinal disease. 
or allegiance may occasionally occur before the onset of GIT disease, be present during the disease process, or persist even after the disease has resolved. Idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease, as in the case of the bowel disease, clinical distinctions between oral manifestation of Crohn disease and selective colitis may be paired with the overlapping clinical features. Non-specific clinical change, such as dry mouth, halitosis, gastric, gastric refluxes, all of these are seen, but they're neither diagnostic and nor helpful in differentiation between two conditions. Microscopic presence, granulomas. Granulomas is considered diagnostic of oral Crohn disease in appropriate clinical settings, whereas microapsis, neutrophil, xenophil, without granulomas is considered consistent with ulcerative colitis in appropriate clinical setting. Crohn disease. Occasionally, the oral manifestation may be first indication in the patient has a Crohn disease, but this oral lesions usually develop in patients with non powell disease. Oral lesions, it look like a multivocal, linear, nodular, polypoid, or diffuse mucosal thickness, and predilections for occurring in the labial and buccal mucosa and mucofacal folds. They are characteristic firm, pink and palous, or tubal patient, unless there is ulceration that may cause by pain on touch or when eating acidic or spicy and hot foods. This ulcer, which is typical resistance and linear and deep and not confusing with aphlous ulcer, which is the shallow and round and oval shaped lesions that heal in approximately seven to 14 days. In this picture, show the male patient uh, with diagnosed with the Crohn disease and the it looks like ulcers and nodular submucosal lesions on the buccal mucosa. And in these pictures, we show the characteristic features of the oral lesions that's seen in the patient with the Crohn disease. Resistant linear deep ulcer, cobblestone mucosal architectures, diffuse swelling of the lip and face, and indural polyboid tag lesions in the vestibule. Definitive diagnosing of the Crohn disease cannot be made by oral biopsy alone. However, biopsy may direct clinician to investigate GIT tract for Crohn disease lesions. Or a lesions Crohn disease typically persistence and remit and relapse over the years. The response of systemic therapy is highly variable and predictable, and they do not necessarily parallel the activity of gut disease. Some oral ulcerative lesion may require topical corticosteroid therapy or even intralesion and corticosteroid injection. Second topic, ulcerative colitis. The oral lesions of ulcerative colitis, termed as biostomatis vegetans, which is rare and the less common than the oral manifestation in the Crohn disease. There is male predilections and the oral outbreak may occur in any age. Uh, oral lesions may precede the GIT disease or lesions, uh, but generally present soon chronically. Clinically, the lesions consider the scattered and common or linear oriented postule on erythematous mucosa at the multiple oral sites, which are variable in severity, but usually spur in the dorsum of the tongue. Postular lesions, approximately 10% of patients develop inflammatory bowel disease associated, associated with arthritis in the temporomandibular joints. In this picture, so there's biostomatis vegetanus, which is the characteristic feature in the patient with ulcerative colitis. And as well in this uh, oral lesion of ulcerative colitis showing the tiny postular in the oral mucosa. Here in the endoscopy of column mucosa with ulceration on the spontaneous bleeding in severe cases with ulcerative colitis. And the other picture showing the endoscoping loss of the norm normal uh, vascular pattern and thermatous column mucosa in the mild case with the ulcerative colitis. The oral lesions usually uh, respond to the colonial disease treatment. Topical or systemic corticosteroid have been used to the rectilens or oral lesions with the variable effectiveness. Uh, second, we, we're talking about the Gardner syndrome, uh, which is a genetic defect on chromosome number five, uh, leading to the autosomal dominant, which is very high risk of malignant transformation into colonic adenocarcinoma. Is usually associated with the number with the extra chronic change, including variable organ system, organ system including the skin, skeleton, skeleton, and the skeleton and the soft tissues. Potential for head and neck manifestation must started in childhood and adolescence. 
multiple osseous in the jaw, supernumerary and interrupted teeth, increased risk of odontoma, osteomas in the jaw and paranasal tinnitus, and with dermoid with skin and head and neck. This, this picture showing the, all the characteristic features that's seen in the patient with the Gardner syndrome, supernumerary teeth, and the lesions in the skin, epithelial cyst and dermoid tumor, uh, the adrenal gland tumor, and the polyps in the stomach and intestine, and the jaw and osteoma in the jaw, and the congenital hypertrophy of retinal pigment epithelium. In osseous, uh, in osseous, and this uh, frequently seen radiographically in the uh, portion of the jaw without evidence in any bony expansion, completely asymptomatic. Uh, Supernumerary and interrupted teeth, uh, mostly common seen in the incisor and cuspid and bicuspid region, while the molar area are rarely affected. Supernumerary teeth usually it's look like a big shape or otherwise misshaped. Odontomas and, and, uh, are the compound time that's more common and distributed as, a stoma, as in the area in the supernumerary teeth. Osteomas, which is called the focal expansion on the surface of the jawbone, which fill through the skin and oral mucosa may be large. Here in red graph show the sister that have a Gardner syndrome uh, with osseous. Here in the, we can see also impacted teeth and osteomas on the mandible. Osteoma and epidermoid cysts are removed surgically if there is large enough and cause functional or cosmetic problems. Asymptomatic impacted teeth may be filled in the place in the jaws if there is no any clinical indication to remove them. It may be necessary to remove one or more of these addition teeth for orthodontic and occlusion consideration or for cosmetic purpose. Uh, odontomas usually surgically cured. Oral manifestation may be usually a gastroenterologist to help identify the syndrome clinically and the early age. So the appropriate screening for the Powell, polyboles, and adenocarcinoma may be undertaken. Patient with the three, six on osteomas lesion, the jaw should be questioned about the possibility of the garden syndrome. Thank you for your attention. And now uh, my colleague, Dr. Namare, who will continue in the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Asma. Assalamu alaikum everyone. I'm Namar Qfat Rahman. I'm going to continue. Next slide, please, Dr. Asma. Hello. Yes, Hello. Namar. Yes, do you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I can't see the slides. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. Okay, Pete's Jigger syndrome. A mutation of the LKB1 gene has been Dr. Namara. Dr. Namara, you are muted. Sorry, I was locked out. Hello, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Pete's Jigger syndrome, a mutation of LKB1 gene, has been found for patients with Pete's Jigger syndrome. This condition, which is associated with hammertomatous polyposis, mostly of the small intestine. Orally, the significant change is in the perioral and or oral pigmentations, which develops in childhood. Non-sun dependent prickling of the skin around the lips and the vermilion zone of the lips is a common feature. Intraorally, the lesions are usually flat, painless, brown pigmented patches of the buccal mucosa, tongue or labial mucosa. No treatment is required for the pigmented lesions unless there are cosmetic or social reasons to treat. These are the intestinal polyps on the Pete's trigger syndrome. We have mal next. We have malabsorption conditions affecting the hematopoiesis, GI disease related to protein caloric malnutrition or micronutrient malabsorption may have an effect on the oral tissues. 
The classical examples are iron malabsorption inducing iron deficiency anemia and vitamin B12 malabsorption in the pernicious anemia. When the malabsorption is sufficiently severe, the first oral manifestation is atrophic glossitis, in which the filiform papilla and sometimes the fungiform papilla of the dorsum of the tongue undergo atrophy, leaving a bald red tongue. Lesions are usually sore, but a more common complaint is a burning sensation that may precede clinically detectable oral lesions. Affected patients are predisposed to developing angular chelitis, which is candidial infection that can be treated with antifungal medications. The gastroenterologist may use atrophic glossitis as an indicator of moderate to severe nutrient malabsorption. This is a patient with a sore, bald, red tongue associated with iron and deficiency anemia. Metastatic disease of the jaws. Malignant neoplasm of the liver and GI tract occasionally metastasize the oral to the oral lesion, to the oral region, most commonly to the posterior mandible and usually through the, hematoge the hematogenous route. Patients with mandibular metastasis may be asymptomatic or may complain of jaw or tooth pain, paresthesia, unilateral or bilateral, numbness of the chin, or loosening of the teeth. Initially, the neoplasm is sometimes found in a non-healing extraction socket after a tooth has been extracted because of unexplained looseness. Radiographs may show irregular, poorly circumscri circumscribed, and often multifocal radiolucencies. Less commonly, metastases may involve the maxilla or oral soft tissues. The GI metastatic, metastatic disease to the oral region is a grave prognostic sign usually indicating widespread metastasis. Few patients survive five years, most die within one year. This is a radiograph showing radiolucent multifocal adenocarcinoma metastatic to the, to the mandible. Jaundice, excess bilirubin in the blood result in the accumulation of bilirubin in tissues, including the oral mucosa, inducing a yellow discoloration. Because bilirubin has an affinity for elastin, the mobile oral soft tissues with higher elastic content, such as lingual frenum and the soft palate, are more severely affected. A yellowish to greenish pigmentation occur in the teeth of children with hyperbilirubinemia during the calcification. As may be seen in the primary teeth of biliary atresia patients, this is not seen in adults. Gastroenterologists may examine the oral tissues to help it in the clinical assessment of the extent of the jaundice. This is a patient with jaundice. Gastric reflux. Enamel erosions by gastric acids may be seen in patients with chronic gastric reflux conditions, such as gastroesophageal reflux disease, hiatus hernia, wine drinking, chronic alcoholism, and bulimia. Clinically, the enamel is lost over broad areas of the teeth that are exposed to the gastric contents. In bulimics, it is commonly seen and is most severe on the inner surface of the maxillary anterior teeth. Uh, the eroded enamel is smooth, shiny, and hard. If it, if it becomes thin enough, the yellowish color of the dentine becomes visible and the teeth may become sensitive to the temperature change. These are the palatal surface of the maxillary teeth of a bulimic patient, the posterior teeth. Okay, here are some of the oral manifestations of the gastrointestinal disorders. Inflammatory, the Crohn's disease, they have mucosal tags, cobblestoning, mucogingivitis, labial and facial swelling, linear ulceration. Uh, recurrent after stomatitis-like ulcerations, uh, angular chelitis. The ulcerative colitis, they have uh, pyostomatitis vegetans, other nonspecific alteration present in Crohn's disease. Gardner syndrome ha has osteomas, dental abnormalities. pitts jigger syndrome has melanotic macule and lesions secondary to anemia. Celiac disease, they have enamel hypoplasia, delayed tooth eruption, bleeding tendencies, dermatitis herpetiforms, signs and symptoms secondary to the anemia. Peptic ulcer disease, they have dark erythematous tongue with a slimy yellowish coating, congestion and dilatation of the sublingual veins. Helicobacter pylori associated gastritis, they have symptoms related to anemia. 
gastroesophageal reflect, reflux disease. They have dental erosions, dysgeusia, sour tastes, halitosis, mucositis, hyperesthesia, burning mouth, and rust like ulcerations. Pernicious anemia, they have atrophic glossitis, glossidemia, the Plummer Vincent syndrome, they have dysphagia and lesion uh, secondary to the ferro uh, ferropenic anemia. The hiatal hernia, they have uh, oral manifestations related with gastroesophageal reflux disease and anemia. The oral manifestations of the GI disease may be useful to the gastroenterologist in the development of differential diagnosis for patients with GI complaints, and oral tissues may offer an easy biopsy site to diagnose conditions such as Crohn's disease in other circum circumstances. The severity or prognosis of the disease can be monitored by the presence or extent of oral manifestations, and the success of the management of the GI disease may be reflected in the response of oral tissues. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Dr. It. Asma and Dr. Namara. Does anybody have any question? Thank you so much, both uh, Dr. Asma and Namara. Uh, this is also an excellent presentation to the point Thank and uh, excellent. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Okay, yes, thank you for your presentation. It was great pictures, great topics, and actually great topic overall. Um, actually, for now, we will skip ad agenda part three because Dr. Fath is busy in the ER, so we will make it the last one. Now we will go to agenda part four. Uh, it's the mock interview, Dr. Amal and Dr. Nuha. Uh, Dr. Amal will act as a program director and interview Dr. Nuha. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Shema. Um, I'll start. Hello, Dr. Nuha. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Amal, the Internal Medicine Program Director. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, actually, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So, Dr. Nuha, can you start by introducing yourself to me? Sure. Uh, I am a physician from Sudan. I was born in uh, Libya and then uh, my family moved to Sudan when I was uh, five years old. Uh, I came from a family of doctors. My uncle and my brother are both doctors. Uh, so that was a kind of initial stimulus for me to join medicine. Uh, I graduated from my medical school in Sudan and then um, I worked as a general practitioner in Sudan. Uh, then I moved to US. I had two clinical rotations in US, one in Maryland and uh, the other one in Michigan. Uh, during my medical school and uh, during my work experiences, uh, I realized that uh, medicine was more than just uh, a profession. Uh, I realized that uh, when you were interacted with uh, something as delicate as uh, human life, then you need to make sure that uh, you were qualified to be in the position that you were granted. Uh, so that's why I decided to pursue a postgraduate uh, training in internal medicine uh, in one of the best healthcare system in the world, uh, that is the United States. So um, that's the reason that uh, bring me to your residency program. Uh, in my free time, I spend quality of time with my family and friends. Uh, other than that, I like um, swimming and I like cooking. Uh, currently, I am uh, doing a telegeriatric research, research fellowship at Michigan State University, and uh, I'm studying for step three. Uh, I'm eager to be part of your program. That's great, Dr. Noha. So you told me that you like cooking. Can you tell me more about that? Yes, sure. Uh, so mostly I cook traditional food uh, for my family and friends. I... Uh, do cook some Italian recipes and some Mediterranean recipes. And sometimes I do some dessert like uh, cake and pies. Interesting. So if you have a chance to practice cooking as a job, would you consider leaving medicine? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, actually, my answer is no because uh, my interest toward medicine began uh, right after I got out of high school. 
So at that time, I was um, actually figured out that my interest toward medicine um, is at the career. So I don't think uh, I would change my decision mm, because also I have uh, a lot of clinical experiences in medicine. So my medical school and uh, my internship at uh, my home country and my clinical experiences in US and Sudan so um, has definitely been enlightening and I don't have any idea about changing my career at this point. Great, so what US clinical rotation you enjoyed the most? Uh, I'd say that uh, actually I have, uh, I did two clinical rotations in US, uh, one in Maryland and the other one in Michigan. Uh, however, I, I like both I like both rotations, uh, but my rotation in uh, University of Maryland Capital Region uh, with Dr. Moore was very unique for me because um, I got exposure to U.S. healthcare system, and uh, this experience did help me a lot uh, because it improved my clinical skills and uh, understanding to the U.S. healthcare system. It also improved my understanding of health insurance policies, and uh, I got exposure to different hospital running systems, uh, managing patients, uh, ranging from seizure, epilepsy, migraine. Uh, some were simple and some were difficult. Uh, going rounding in the hospital and uh, working in multidisciplinary team alongside with different subspecialty, and all of these things uh, improve my clinical exposure itself. And uh, why our program? Uh, okay, that is a great question. I think that uh, your program is uh, aligning with what I want to achieve in my life. So I think um, the most important thing for me is uh, not only Excel as a physician, uh, but also as a researcher as well. So um, I think that the research culture at your program and with the clinical training that your program and uh, your program providing are very inter important for me. So I think uh, it aligns with my personal goals. So I think uh, this quality of your program, it makes your program one of the best for me. Uh, what would you say about your top three strengths? Okay, so... Um, I would say that uh, my biggest strength, I think, uh, I am very organized. And uh, for that, I always try to keep a checklist of things with me so that I don't miss out anything. Uh, I work in a very systematic manner, and I have applied that to my work. Uh, so that really helps a lot during my practice life. Um, secondly, I would say that uh, I am a great team player. During my rotation in both um, US and Sudan, I really got along with all of my coworkers and I have developed a really friendly atmosphere with them. And uh, thirdly, I would say that uh, I am very professional and I take responsibility in my actions. I, I try to shoulder all of the responsibilities that are placed on me and uh, I trust my co colleague and I expect them to do the same thing for me. And uh, what is your biggest weakness? Okay, so uh, that is a good question. Uh, regarding my weakness, I would say that uh, my weakness is regarding learning and working. So I think uh, that sometimes I can't recognize my own limitations in terms of what I can do in a, in a given time uh, because I want to do everything i want to learn a lot of things but uh, you know time is uh, a limited resource and uh, sometimes i tend to ignore that fact and try to do too much at one time uh, so now i am cognizant of that fact and now i am trying to take it slowly and trying to understand my own limitations where do you see yourself in 10 years uh, okay, so uh, I think uh, 10 years is a lot of time. I can't say with certainty what will happen in 10 years. However, uh, if everything goes well, I see myself as a practicing physician in US 
I will certainly be practicing internal medicine in US. Um, I have yet not decided on what the subspecialty that I want to pursue. I think uh, I would like to get a taste of all different subspecialty during my residency and then uh, decide on what sub, uh, subspecialty I want to pursue. That's interesting. So why should we choose you for our residency program? Okay, so um, uh, thank you for this question. I think, um, of course, you have a lot of great applicants who are more than capable of shining themselves in any residency program. Uh, however, I think uh, you should choose me because of uh, my all the strengths that I mentioned. I think uh, all of these strengths can allow me to bring a diverse experience to your program because I have experience uh, in Sudan and in US so I think overall, it makes me a very well-rounded applicant for your program. And uh, I think uh, I can bring a diverse set of exposure to your program. That's great. And what makes you interested in internal medicine? Uh, I think uh, I believe that uh, internal medicine provide a very holistic experience of different kinds of patient population and uh, I enjoy diversity. And even though I believe that in the future, I might want to pursue a fellowship. Uh, however, I want to become a very grounded in terms of all the specialty at this point of time. So uh, I believe that uh, this diversity that internal medicine provide is, sometime, is something that uh, will enable me to become a complete physician before I decide to pursue a specific subspecialty. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Noha. That was my last question. Do you have any questions for me? Yes, uh, actually, I have one question. Uh, when I was uh, going through your website, uh, so it say that uh, there is a clinical educator tract and the community outreach tract as well. So uh, I'm just uh, want to know to ask, are those tracts decided uh, at the beginning of residency or, or later on? So it's both. Uh, typically, we ask you to decide that before, but you have the ability to switch between tracks in the first year. After the first year, you, your elective rotations are scheduled based on the track you choose. But if you undecided, you can follow the regular track throughout the first year, and then at the end of it, uh, you can choose either one. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for answering my question. Do you have any other question? No, thank you. Okay, thanks. For, thank you for interviewing with us today and uh, wish you the very best of luck with your match. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nader. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, Dr. Nader, can you give us your valuable feedback, please? Thank you so much. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you so much, uh, both uh, Noha and Ahmed. This is uh, really uh, excellent. Uh, I think you did a good preparation, Noha. Uh, if you practice, that's well and good. If you didn't, I think uh, uh, you, you showed us uh, uh, excellent preparation. A uh, couple of uh, things. Uh, one of uh, them is smiling. So you don't have the camera on, I know. Uh, but yeah. sometimes from uh, your uh, answers, if you can inject some laugh or some some laugh, okay. giggling, <laughs> some, <laughs> some something to to lessen the mood of uh, being as serious. Uh, I know when when you will do your interview. Hopefully the camera will be on, and you're gonna keep your smiles uh, all, all all the time. Um, as far as the answers, I think you did great. Uh, but again, if you have any chance to highlight some of the keywords, uh, you mentioned teamwork, you mentioned uh, some of the um, strength. Uh, these are excellent. And I would add to this uh, that uh, you want to use uh, the, the checklist but also you want to organize and prioritize the things that you want to do. Because in residency, uh, they want you to see patients 
make orders like order the labs and then follow these labs so you want to do many things but you want to do the important ones first and then you mm -hmm. come to do the next because if you cannot do all of them they want you to uh, pass it mm -hmm. on to other residents uh, mm -hmm. and the team something like that so uh, i would add organization and uh, prioritizing and make things in a small chunks like uh, task oriented so these are keywords that uh, maybe you can use or similar words or you can add uh, different uh, as far as the weakness i think you handle it well and uh, I, I think you can say there is always room for improvement and i'm working on that and uh, uh, this will be uh, overcome uh, by experience and so forth um, i like the answer that you you will test the uh, rotations and then decide the fellowship uh, if you decide that, but I would uh, mention that uh, the, the the idea I have is I'm going to pursue uh, further after residency. Uh, I want to uh, select some sub specialty, and uh, I will do that during residency. Mm -hmm. and do the testing or uh, see which one. Is. Yeah, but I think you handled all the questions uh, well and good. Uh, we didn't have okay, questions you. for behaviors yeah. or uh, 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 not uncommon uh, questions, but uh, be prepared. Uh, maybe 80% will be the questions uh, that you know, but maybe 10, 20%, maybe you will have a question that uh, put you in a, a stressful situation. Uh, so try to, this is why I mentioned that if, if you have the camera on, you can, uh, last time I think someone uh, mention the, the the way to uh, let's see you use your body language to show them that you are thinking about the question and then uh, divide your answer into separate section section one section mm -hmm. two section three and it will work for any question unexpected uh, that they ask you about let's say I will ask you about uh, what 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 you like to cook or something like that. And, uh, this is not the common question that, uh, but uh, uh, you can handle the question in a, in a uh, organized manner, let's say. But for that question, you answer it very well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Nadir, for uh, valuable advices. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Any other feedback from other fellows? I know we have some uh, videos on the app or on YouTube that uh, they added a lot of tips and uh, how to do and or not to do. Any input from other? Yes, if I may speak. Yes, go ahead, uh, Shema. Dr. Shema. Yeah, thank you. So, like Dr. Nader said, you 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 seem tired when you're speaking, uh, even without the camera on the listeners know you're actually not very engaged and you're very i wouldn't say stressed but you, there is no enthusiasm in your voice this is something that you want to tell the interviewer i am interested i am excited to have uh, this opportunity so make your voice tone um reflecting your feelings um plus yeah try to talk to yourself in the mirror to decrease the background noise of um when you're thinking yes we think but uh, it's better to think in silence than doing the um, thing we all do uh, this is one point second point um when you were asked um uh, i'm not sure what the question was but maybe your specialty or something um you just said I have experience in the US, experience here and there. I think this is not a specific answer to this question. Uh, you have to um, show your passion to your specialty, to your career in medicine, and not just because you have experience in it. So maybe you can tell another specific question. For example, I love this specialty because so and so, and when I did that, I found myself uh, really enjoying, and I find my call in this career. 
uh, something more enthusiastic and more excited, uh, not because you have experience. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. And so that I don't be on the negative side all the time. You did very well job receiving the questions. Thank you, thank you for this interesting question and uh, doing an introduction of your answer before. So what I think I have as a weakness, this is something that you did well. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I will work on that. Thank you. Mm, yeah, you're welcome. So please, anybody who have a feedback, please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you so much for your feedback, Dr. Nader, and thank you, Dr. Shema. You're welcome. Okay, if anybody can give Dr. Noha feedback. Hello, this is Ragna. My only feedback is when she asked about, tell me about your strengths, you shouldn't start with, I think. I think that shows, when you start your, your answer with, I think that shows you are less confident it's strength, so you should show it how strong you are. Other than that, you did really great. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your feedback. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rahman. Anybody else? Please feel free. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Alaikum and good luck for everyone. Yeah, so the question that they ask you, what do you see yourself in the, in five, 10 or a couple of years? Uh, I think, I think uh, you can say that after uh, finishing my residency program, uh, yeah, you can, you can give like two, three choice of sub-speciality. I'm not, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure until now which one I choose, but I think after I, after I done with my residency, I will, I will decide. But I think if you if you give some some speciality you are interested in, and then after you finish your residency or decide to go through it, and also you said that you the program has research and you are interested, so you can add after I finish my residency and my fellowship in that speciality I'm interested in research, and so I plan to join the institute that where I, where I can you know combine teaching, research, and patient care. I think this will be a, a better answer or uh, addition to your answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the great advice. You're welcome. Good luck for everyone. Great advice, Dr. Shaza. I also think um, you have to, like they say, sell yourself. Uh, so when you say you are interested in research, you have to add um, something about yourself. I also have experience in doing this and this in research. I published this, I submitted this. Um, so this is a way to sell yourself. You say in you're interested in something and then you say you actually have experience. That's why you're more interested to continue this career. Okay, anybody else have yeah. any? Yeah, sure. Any input? Okay, if nobody else has um, any input for our Hi, doctors. Um, I have yes, a question. Yes, go on. Yeah, okay. So I've been reading um, um, new trends for questioning where a lot of program director asks question um, uh, surrounding COVID-19 and impacts of COVID-19 um, with you, whether um, you had delaying with exams or delaying with applying or even just like mental health. How could we navigate those questions uh, without seeming, for lack of a better word, um, week because I'm pretty sure COVID had like a very negative impact on everyone um, and um, some had like mental uh, health impact just like with the stress of family members uh, who aren't in the same place as you um, getting sick and some died and some didn't so how could you navigate these types of questions without um, making it seem negative on you 
like I, you don't want them to use it against you where they're like oh well um hospital is also a highly stressful um environment um that means this um candidate cannot work under high pressure yes great question dr arish so dr nader um do you have any input for this question so um it's an excellent question great one and uh, as i said uh, expect some questions that might not be common so each program might be unique or different and they may try to uh, understand uh, your situation and uh, how you will be valuable member to their team uh, so my take for that is why did they ask this question um, number one they want to see how you communicate so your communication skills so when they ask you about your weakness or tell me more about yourself they, they know more of the stuff in from the application or the uh, cv or the paperwork they know a lot of about you a lot of things so they are not after um, these written uh, things. They want to see how you can express yourself. How is your English language? How you can connect uh, between one sentence and the other? How your um, way of thinking? So this number one. Uh, number two, uh, they uh, one of the advice that was uh, mentioned in the uh, videos in the past like uh, one of the program director mentioned that if the let's say the program director is asking you in a serious manner then you want to follow that serious manner if they are laughing around and joking then you want to uh, boo, be with the same mood like them so back to your question they ask you about your uh, situation or COVID or your uh, experience with COVID you have to answer according every one of us has different uh, encounter as far as here in the us or outside uh, you can take it from different angle you can take it from uh, just the word vulnerability each one of us is vulnerable uh, so uh, covid showed us every single uh, person community or country is vulnerable, even the US. Uh, it hit us very hard, so we were not as prepared. The last pandemic was 100 years ago. So although we were trying to prevent similar uh, bad outcomes uh, to that pandemic, we still have, uh, haven't done that as well. So on a personal level, you can say, uh, my experience with COVID is such uh, if you got infected, you can mention some of the symptoms or some of the cases. If you have losses in the families, you can mention that. Uh, or you can add the aspect if you are working in a clinical setting where you cared for patients here in the US or overseas, um, you can mention about the uh, positive and negative of the vaccine when it came out, like um, the hesitancy. So what did you do as far as educating your families about accepting the uh, vaccination or your community? Did you talk to your patients, uh, your family members, uh, friends, relatives, something like that? Uh, so you can take it to that level where you will talk about uh, uh, vaccination acceptance for instance so it's it's just uh, mm -hmm. an, an open the door for you to share your experience however you look at it they don't want you to say i had a very bad uh, uh, infection or something like that they're not after you as um, a, a person uh, to tell them what happened to you uh, they want to say or to see your reflection, uh, your uh, ability to communicate, your 
if it's suffering, what kind of things uh, you want to prevent in the future or uh, to improve. Uh, so I can say, like you can mention that maybe at one point they want to put you under stress, but your answer is supposed to show that you are uh, able, able to, to communicate very well. If you think about the answer, if you can divide it into two or three sections or aspects, you can say on a personal level, on a community level, or a country level, or whatever level that you think about, you can talk about it. Uh, or uh, you can talk about it from uh, the effect uh, on the health, but also the effect of how we did uh, as far as vaccination. And then you talk about uh, the treatment and the future, how we can solve it. Uh, so there are many ways to answer a question. Uh, I think it's just depend on, uh, as I mentioned to uh, the fellows in the past, you, you want to use your, let's say, uh, uh, not clinical skills, but your presentation skills, your language skills, your body language, your uh, speaking level. And then top of that, you want to identify areas when you answer your question into two or three uh, things. So when you smile, when you say, oh, you got me or something like that, and then you take a deep breath and say, okay, it affects me in this, 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 my families, my whatever relatives. And then on a different level, I did this, this, if you're uh, taking care of patients or uh, we talk about vaccination and I think the vaccination in Sudan happened this, 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 or in Saudi Arabia or here in the US, initially in certain communities where I live, it was like hesitancy or something like that. So you can uh, maneuver the answer or you take the, the, the person with you the way you want, if I'm making sense. Yeah, it makes complete sense. <laughs> Good question. Any other questions or any other feedback? Or... Uh, Dr. Nader, I have a question if uh, I'm interested in internal medicine, but I have uh, two year experience in the emergency department. So if they ask me, uh, you are interested in internal medicine, so why working in the emergency department? What would I see? What would I say? Thank you. Yeah, uh, excellent, excellent question. So uh, I, I think the best answer is to, to answer the question with some honesty. Uh, so what happened to you? So you, you, you work in the ER here in the US or uh, back home or in uh, some other place? I worked uh, back home, okay. not in the so, U.S. Okay, so uh, you can, did you have any experience in the U.S. or shadowing? No, or not yet. Uh -huh. Okay, so sometimes if, if you can, um, I mean, uh, what led you to decide to, to, to do to medicine uh, in, instead of emergency? Or are you applying to both? No, I'm applying for internal medicine only. But uh, okay. so yes, I was practicing. Okay. Yeah. One thing I would, if I, uh, I mean, your shoes. Let let let's say. So I will tell them that uh, this is my experience back home. I was doing this, and uh, I found that uh, emergency medicine was doable, and uh, I continued on that. Uh, and it seems to be like now I have my family when I came to the US, uh, it's different uh, system, different environment, different culture. One of the things that I'm thinking about is lifestyle, my family and uh, my patients. Uh, uh, I want to uh, serve my patient with quality of care. And uh, I found that in telemedicine uh, provide this opportunity so I can see my patients longitudinally. Uh, in emergency medicine, I have to see them only once and then forget about them. Uh, as far as um, care, uh, 
uh, and the lifestyle. I have uh, my uh, whatever if you have kids, so I want to uh, provide some uh, time for them as well. And I want to do, let's say, I want to do research uh, within the family medicine, or you can say, or oh, internal uh, or you can say, I want, I want to to join an academic um, institution where I can uh, provide longitudinal care for my patients, and I want to do some research and teaching, and these uh, are my options that I found in your program suitable for me, and I love that. So just mention that. This is my passion, this is your love, this is what you want to do. For real, if this is what you want. If it nice makes... answer, Dr. Nader, thank you. You're welcome. I think uh, one or two raised their hands. Uh, go ahead, whoever. Hello. And, uh, number. Yeah, yes. yeah, go ahead. Um, hello, Dr. Nader. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, if uh, you can hear me, I have a question. All the time when I hear, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, Doctor, first prepare for interview. Uh, after all the time, like superhero. Uh, could you hear me, please? Uh, can you repeat the question because it's uh, your yeah, first I time mean, in and I, out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I mean, the answer all the time, make doctor like superhero. I'm very uh, active worker, I'm dedicated patient. So how make the answer more natural? So... I mean, uh, want, yeah. I mean about the answer. So they, they want you to shine. They want you to brag. They want you to be the super, superhero. Uh, but at the same time, they want you to show the skills, as I mentioned, uh, because really they want you to be a worker in, in, in a healthcare system. They want you to see the patient, write the notes and go further. They want you to pass the exam and the board exam uh, is, is, is important for them. If you are in the rural area uh, community um, program, they want you at least to show them that you are interested in primary care, let's say, or family, and you want to stay in the area or you want to join their staff or faculty or whatever, uh, because you are dedicated in that area. So, uh, if you are applying to an academic area, they want you to show that you work hard in your research experience and skills. And uh, in addition to the teaching, if you are interested in teaching so that uh, you can show them you want to become a faculty and you want to teach the students, medical students or residents, uh, you want to do some research and so forth. So there is nothing wrong with bragging about yourself or putting yourself as a superhero. Uh, as long as you are stating the facts, so you don't lie, uh, you don't add things, uh, but they want you to uh, show them that you are a good listener. So when they ask a question, if you don't understand the question, uh, you can um, ask them to repeat the question or rephrase the question. And this is a communication skills because you're gonna see patients, they're gonna give you information. If you cannot communicate well, uh, you need to ask them to um, rephrase things so that you understand their um, complaints, for instance. Uh, they want you to, uh, what we mentioned earlier, to uh, show them that you are an intelligent person, that you process the question and give an answer you think about it. And if you have a plan and this answer, you show them your plan. Let's say they ask you about uh, 10 years uh, from now, what do you think yourself? So my answer, and that like what mentioned here, uh, in 10 years, I will do this, this, this. This is not the right way to do it. There's no right, right wrong, but uh, the best way to do it is to say, uh, okay, my short plan or uh, in uh, after I work with, let's say, join your team, uh, if you accept me, I'll uh, try to search uh, what options do I have. I'm interested in uh, primary care as a uh, first step, but in the meantime, I will see if other subspecialty might interest me. 
maybe I will uh, add one or two, let's say nephrology seems to be okay, uh, but I'm not sure about cardiology. So I will try to do uh, some rotation and see which one is best fit me. And then I will decide. So I'm sure in 10 years, I will either become uh, a family doctor or a primary care provider uh, with no, no subspeciality, if this is what you want really. Or you can say, uh, I, I will be a specialist, but I haven't decided yet. Uh, hopefully after uh, the first year uh, or the second year, I know exactly what direction I will go. Uh, but uh, my goal is to be uh, specialized in the area that uh, I will provide the care that my patients will deserve or the high quality of care, something like that. If this answer make, makes sense. Any other questions? So in the US, they want you to brag about yourself and uh, yes. whatever you are applying to any, any not specifically in, in, in interviews like uh, in telemedicine, but in any, any other place you want to, to apply to, uh, you want to show them that you are the best of the best. Uh, and for example, uh, here, what, what, uh, who's the president, uh, last one, uh, he just brags about himself. All lies on lies on lies, but he, 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 uh, he get attraction or um, with whatever he says, he, 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 he knows what he's going to, the goal, if he wanted to be in the White House, he went there and, uh, just bragged everything. And if you listen, I, I try to listen to some of the talks from a, a previous president or some of the nice talks, but you can use this same approach or same, same, same technique mm -hmm. where you can use very um, beautiful words, like excellent, uh, splendid or uh, awesome or whatever in your answers and you'll be the greatest person if you're using this over and over and over. If you want to apply to a certain uh, position, see, uh, use words that express your skills and uh, experience and whatever in a form that you shine. And for these interviews, I think you want to do that. I think you, you, you want to show uh, whatever Let's say you did hear presentation, so you want to mention that uh, I like teaching, and in fact, I was working with uh, this group or this team um, in the fellowship, and we were discussing, and I was teaching, and I, but I, in fact, I presented this topic, whatever topic you presented, or I worked with a team, and we presented this poster in so and so conference, something like that. So you want to show them that um, what you love and what you did about it. So that when you join their team, uh, you will continue to do uh, great. Thank you. Yes, I thank you, doctor. I also think the same. Yes, sure. go okay. on, Ravna. I just want to add something to that really funny. Uh, do you guys know Trevor Noah, the comedian, the stand-up comedy? So mm -hmm. he was saying something about how Barack Obama was the president. He said he went to the Nelson Mandela and he told him, I want to be the first black, Amer the, black uh, the first black president in the U.S. He was like, you wouldn't be that with that voice. You have to have a confident tone. You have to have rasp in your, in your like sounds. You have to have a bass. And that's how you can show how you are strong and how you are confident. So just believe in yourself. Even if you stumble or you stutter, it's all right, as long as you have a strong voice showing who you are. I can say that I make a sugar cookies, although it's made for only four ingredients, but I can sound it like it's a hard thing and show you that I really, really ace it. So just about how you present it. That's my only comment. Thank you.
You're welcome. So uh, like Dr. Nada said, the U.S. here likes the culture of bragging, but with humility. So actually we are superheroes, but uh, because all of our colleagues are super superheroes, we always compare ourselves with them. So we fear we are lacking, but uh, in actuality and in real life, what we do is not, uh, is not, we are good enough. So you don't, you have to have, um, bright in what you do you are good enough and you don't need to make lies or exaggerate what you do is actually something awesome being a doctor uh, striving for this pathway so have confidence in yourself um sorry i have a comment about this point because one of the comment program director when they some uh, you know some resident in, in their interview they present uh, they answer like uh, I graduated from one of the most uh, like most prestigious university in my country they 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 think the program director they don't know about their country and about the university there so this is I think uh, this is not a typical question should be more natural that's I agree with you if I uh, I want to add something that um, all of us will have different um, you know like experience uh, along the journey of USMLEs and to the residency so I think if any of us talk about this journey and how uh, this journey shaped their personality how it changed them what they learn what they get or what they gain from this experience is going to be unique for them their answer is not going to be similar to any other resident and I think that will be great during the, the interview. Yes, and actually saying that you graduated from somewhere stellar or somewhere very prestigious, as long as it's not a complete lie, uh, the U.S. culture likes you to have ride in where you trained and where you studied, so that in the future when you train at their institution, you will have ride in being a part of them. Uh, so they are actually looking, if you are our colleague, how will you speak about us? Will you say it at this medium or average institution or will you have bride in where you are training at? Uh, this is another point. Dr. Nader, do you have anything else to say to us? No, I, I think uh, referring to the last uh, sentence you mentioned about the, uh, I mean, um, the institution or the, the program director knows, uh, again, they, 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 they might have some of residents from the same country and you are from. So that might be a plus sign or something that um, you think about, but always try to take advantage of uh, how you use whatever experience, whatever uh, skills that you have to mention them in a positive way to sell yourself so that you can be uh, a real asset or something useful for the program and not a problem for the program. And you want to make sure uh, they know you are a hard worker and you focus on achieving the goals so that when you finish the three years with their program, you're going to focus on passing the board. So this is an important thing uh, for them. Uh, so if you didn't pass, let's say, uh, step one for, from the first step uh, or first time, you should mention that if they ask about that. Uh, you want to work them to tell them uh, at that time I was whatever reason you have, but you can mention I learned from my mistake, and this is now I am planning to do this, this is, or I did this, this is to pass step three, and I succeeded that uh, in that, and uh, this is my uh, way of handling things now. Whatever you did to to make the changes positively in your life. So this is what they, they want to, to you to show them. One of the things I can brag about, or I want you to mention, if you can, about this, what we are doing now, that program like uh, research. So you can mention one of the 
area things that uh, <coughs> excuse me um, after medical school i did not have a great grasp or skills in research uh, but i did whatever you did let's say you did uh, externship you work in uh, hospital you did this and uh, last year i found this great uh, program and i joined it because i want to improve my skills i want to not only uh, do the research part of it but i want to uh, increase my commun uh, communication skills or teaching skills or uh, whatever leadership skills or teamwork so that i can benefit uh, my patients in the future, something like that. So uh, you try to, to use whatever experiences or uh, skills and try to put it in a positive way so that the program can uh, notice the improvement in your CV and uh, you will be a good thing. You're not going to be a problem person for the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nader. If anybody has any comment, please say them now. Hello, everyone. Hello, Munya. Hi. Uh, I just would like to uh, highlight uh, what uh, Dr. Nader has mentioned before, that um, Dr. Nuha sounded so serious. I mean, it's, it's very important to be, um, as a doctor, it's um, an important part of uh, their personality to be um, serious. But I think at some points you need to show them that you're joyful and the spontaneous part of your personality, you know, especially working in a highly stressful uh, setting as residency. Like, yeah, like you um, smile or show them that uh, you are more spontaneous and natural when you talk, like as you are in the real life. Yeah, thank you, that was it. Okay, thank you for your feedback. Okay, you're welcome. So maybe we can go to our next presentation. Uh, electronic medical records, the most common ones by Dr. Swaiba and Dr. Fatha Rahman. Please go on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, good morning. My name is Sobia, and today I'll be presenting the topic uh, electronic records. I'll share my screen and let me know if you guys can see. Okay. Are you able to see? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we'll go over the topic electronic record. So some people use the term electronic medical record and electronic health record, EMR and EHR interchangeably. While it may seem a little picky at first, so, yeah. the diff so, uh, yeah. Uh, we are seeing an empty slide. Uh, oh, okay. Let me fix it. Thanks. Okay, so do you see it now? Yes, can you maximize? It's not maximized? No, it's frozen again, I think, yeah. Let me share again. Okay, so How about now? So I think when you hit the uh, presenter view, it will open a new window and we are still in the PowerPoint window view. So oh, Now? Yes, perfect. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, yes. So, introduction. Like some people use the term electronic medical record and electronic health record, EMR and EHR interchangeably. While it may seem a little tricky at first, the difference between the two terms is actually quite significant. The EMR term came along first, and indeed, early EMRs were medical. They were for use by clinicians, mostly for diagnosis and the treatment. In contrast, health relates to the condition of being sound in body, mind, or spirit, especially freedom from physical disease or pain. The general condition of body, the word health, covers a lot more territory than the word medical, and EHR goes a lot, lot further than EMR. So what's the difference? So electronic medical records are a digital version of paper charts in the clinician's office. An EMR contains the medical and treatment history of the patient in one practice. EMRs have advantages over the paper records. For example, EMR allows clinicians to track data over time, easily identify which, which patients are due for preventive screening or checkup, check how their patients are doing on certain parameters such as blood pressure readings or vaccinations, monitor and improve overall quality of care within the practice, but the information in EMRs doesn't travel easily out of the practice. In fact, the patient's record might even have to be printed out and delivered by mail to specialists and other members of the care tree. In that regard, EMRs are not much better than a paper record. Whereas EHR, which is electronic health records, are defined as the longitudinal electronic record of patient health information generated by one or more encounters in any care delivery setting. EHRs do all those things and more, and more EHRs uh, focus on the total health of the patient going beyond standard clinical data collected in the provider's office and inclusive of a broader view on a patient's care. EHRs are designed to reach out beyond the health organization that originally collects and compiles the information. They are built to share information with other healthcare providers such as the laboratory specialists so that uh, they contain information from all the clinicians involved in the patient's care. The information moves with the patient to the specialist and hospital, the nursing home, and next state, even other countries. So this is a glimpse of how, uh, what the features are, like you, you can see demographics, there's, there are images, charts, a lot of data about particular patient, and you can just enter into a patient portal and see and uh, get any information regarding that patient. So the roles of electronic health record. Uh, it represents patient's health history. It is a medium of communication among healthcare practitioners. It is a legal document for healthcare. It is a source for clinical outcomes and health services research, resource for practitioner education, and it uh, also provides alerts, reminders, and quality improvement. So the data components documented in electronic health records contain important data such as patient profile and demographics, the medical history, which includes information about the allergies, illnesses, immunization, disorders, and diseases, medicine taken and its compatib uh, compatibility with the drug interaction, and records of the appointment. Also, the admission nursing notes, daily charting, physical assessment, present complaints, diagnosis, tests, procedures, treatment, medication administration, progress notes, laboratory data, and radiology reports, referrals, discharge history, and billing reports. The components of electronic health records are three. Uh, the clinical decision support system, computerized physician order entry system, and health information exchange. So clinical decision support system. A, a system which is a, it is a system uh, as a software that assists the provider in making decisions with regard to the patient care. Uh, it provides physicians and nurses with real-time diagnostic and treatment recommendations. Uh, the functions of clinical decision support systems are managing clinical complexities, monitoring medication errors, avoiding duplicate and unnecessary tests, supporting clinical diagnosis and treatment plan processes, promoting use of best practices and conditions, specific guidelines, and providing the latest information about the drug, cross-referencing a patient allergy to a medi uh, medication, and alerts for drug interactions and other potential patient issues. Patient safety with electronic health record, researchers found that computerized physician reminders increase the use of influenza and pneumococcal vaccinations from practically 0% to 35 and 50% respectively for hospitalized patients. Uh, 
uh, it uh, also shows uh, it also uh, showed that prevention of complications with electronic health records. Uh, for example, Wilson et al. found a significant association between computerized reminders and pressure ulcer prevention in hospitalized patients. They found a 5% decrease in development of pressure ulcers six months after the implementation of com uh, computerized reminders that targeted hospital nurses. The best use of practice with EHR. Rosie and Every found that computerized reminders as part of a, a clinical decision support system uh, have been linked to an 11.3% increase in appropriate hypertension treatment in a primary care setting. Uh, so the uh, ternary at L found a 40.3% uh, decrease in the number of diagnostic tests ordered, uh, ordered per visit and a 12.9% decrease in diagnostic test costs per visit when using an EHR with clinical decision support system along with uh, computerized physician order entry components. So these components go hand in hand with each other. Now coming to computerized physician order entry. So it is a software that allows physicians to enter orders directly into the computer computer rather than doing so on paper. For example, giving orders of drugs, laboratory tests, radiology, and physical therapy. So the benefits are it eliminates the potentially dangerous medical errors caused by poor penmanship of the physician. It eliminates errors caused by unclear telephone orders. It also makes the ordering process more efficient because nursing and pharmacy staffs do not need to seek clarification or to solicit missing information from Ill, uh, illegible or incomplete orders. It also enhances the patient's safety. There is this evidence, the study suggests that serious medication errors can be reduced by 55% when a computerized physician order entry system is used alone, and by 83% when coupled with a clinical decision support system that uh, creates alerts based on what the physician orders. So using the uh, clinical uh, computerized physician order entry system, especially when it is linked to a clinical decision support system, can result in improved efficiency and effectiveness of the care. The last component, which is the health information exchange. Uh, it is the process of sharing patients' electronic health information between different organizations and can create many efficiencies in the delivery of the healthcare. Once the health data are available electronically to the providers, EHRs facilitate the sharing of patient information to health information exchange. The benefits are it allows for the secure and potentially real-time sharing of patient information. It can reduce costly redundant tests. Uh, it facilitates the exchange of this information via EHRs, which can result in much more cost-effective and higher quality of care. So a uh, few technologies which are involved in electronic health records are like picture archiving and communication systems, barcoding, radio frequency identification, automated dispensing medicines, electronic medication administration reports. So you see here it's um, photo, uh, photo archiving and communication system. Um, so this technology captures and integrates diagnostic and the radiological images from various devices. It also stores them and disseminates them to a medical record, a clinical data repository, or other points of care. For example, like uh, X-rays, MRI, CT scans. So any patient having gotten done any of these uh, uh, scans can have their data stored in their patient portal and any doctor at any point of their care can look into any past uh, uh, like such test and can emit uh, this exposure of again going through such radiation. So yes, then this barcoding. An optical scanner is used to electronically capture information encoded on a product. Initially, it is used for medication. So it consists of a barcode, readers, a portable computer with wireless connection, so the nurse can verify patients as well as drugs. Radio frequency identification. This technology tracks patients throughout the hospital and links lab and medication tracking through a wireless communication system. It is neither mature nor widely available, but may be an alternative to barcoding in future. Now comes the automated uh, advising medicine. So, uh, automated uh, dispensing medicines are computerized drug storage devices, which allow medications to be stored and dispensed near the patient, uh, near the point of care, while controlling and tracking the drug distribution. Uh, it reduces pharmacy labor by 90%, technician labor by 72% and lowers the drug inventory by 20%, cuts missing medications by 92% and also lowers the expired medication cost by 64%. Uh, 
इलेक्ट्रॉनिक इलेक्ट्रॉनिक एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन रिकॉर्ड सो इलेक्ट्रॉनिक मेडिकेशन एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन रिकॉर्ड अलर्ट द नर्स अबाउट द नेक्स्ट डोज ऑफ क्वेश्चन अबाउट द मेडिकेशन nurses take the cart near to the patient and scan the medication in the patient wrist pen so overall the benefits of electronic health records are it improves the access to the medical records decrease time spent in documentation increase time for client care improved quality care facilitation of the data collection for research improved communication and decrease poten uh, potential for errors and creation of a lifetime clinical record facilitated by information system uh also there are some drawbacks so which includes the financial issues changing uh, changes in the workflow may be a temporary loss of productivity associated with ehr adoption privacy and security concerns the financial issues which include adoption and implementation costs ongoing maintenance costs and loss of revenue associated with temporary loss of productivity that thank you so now uh, dr elisari would uh, like take you to uh, take you through a, a system like uh, athena if he is here dr elisani um okay so he mentioned he is uh, in uh, emergency department he's on call and probably uh, by the end of the presentation he might join and show you to how athena works and how the system practically works and show you some features of the system thank you for my part that was my part thank you dr subia i think dr fathir rahman is still not available thank you so much dr subia this is great uh, also an excellent presentation thanks for sharing uh, great work uh, any thank comments uh, as far as uh, those who did uh, rotation or extension uh, here in the us any one of you can reflect on your experience with amr how do you find it any addition any comments i had this exposure but a very minimal exposure so i was working in an outpatient setting so i saw the physician working on ecws which is e clinic work so i i got a glimpse on how that works like there was a portal where you can enter into the patient uh, portal and in the particular patient you can just grab into any uh, past histories and past uh, like uh, any test he has gotten like echocardiograms and stress tests and you can just pull them and just see everything so it was really great yeah excellent so i have used uh, different uh, amr uh, during my uh, practice uh, so i started with uh, i adopted the idea early on so when the push was for electronic medical record so i used uh, a free version it was uh, it's still there it's called practice fusion uh, now it's uh, you pay for that but at that time it was as sophia mentioned uh, it's helpful as far as collecting all the information in one place then uh, new companies get into the market and uh, more and more options uh, were available so nowadays you have you have epic uh, serna uh, e works and uh, e clinical or md so there are different options for each as long as you are on you know, or you are in the group or you are hospital system uh, and sometimes people will try one and if it's not working you're going to switch to another Uh, but the cost is is one factor that uh, people or organizations uh, think about like uh, at msu we used to have a system and at the hospital spare hospital they have epic and then when msu wanted to change or switch their mr uh, as physician we recommended that we want to go with uh, epic 
uh, but the MSU decided to go with a different company, Athena. Uh, I think it's because of the cost, the difference in the cost is uh, very high. So, uh, so some physician uh, use that and they are fine. Uh, for me, I practice in uh, long-term facilities, so and subacute. Uh, so each facility I go to, they uh, use their own. Uh, but nowadays, more, more uh, and more uh, facilities they use one uh, electronic medical record uh, made for specifically long-term, so nursing homes specifically. So I use that. It's very primitive. It's it's very simple. Uh, it uh, has uh, capacity to do basic uh, medication list, uh, reconciliation, order list, uh, uh, progress note, uh, but the rest will be uh, scanning. So uh, I told you Sparrow has Epic. We have, uh, it's called point click and care, and they don't communicate. So the idea is to have a system where electronically they are supposed to go back and forth. So uh, a patient at Sparrow, uh, if they decide to discharge the patient to my facility, we have to print that and then scan it and upload it to our system and vice versa. If uh, a patient uh, is not doing well in the facility that I see them there, when I try to send them, I have to print my note, send it with the patient, and at the hospital, they scan it into the system, uh, which is, we are not there yet. It's kind of, uh, uh, in a sense, the paper format might be a better. The other, other things, uh, it, it needs a lot of attention. Uh, in the past, you use some forms, you just check, 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 and you are done with your visit and documentation. And now you have to click and open the new form, click another. So your note uh, with one patient may take longer compared to uh, paper format. Uh, there is a way to overcome that with the dictation. So you dictate and then someone will transcribe or uh, in some hospital, the physician will have a transcriber where you just see the patient and someone else will take the notes for you. Uh, that might be efficient uh, and time as far as time measurement is better. So there is a positive side, there is a negative side, but all in all, I think all hospitals, all clinics, uh, it's required to, to use uh, electronic medical records. So uh, I bet when, when you start your residency, uh, you will have some training in the system or maybe more than one system where you will practice to uh, use that system. But thank you so much, uh, Sobia, for the uh, brief condensed yeah, presentation. Excellent one. Anybody else? So uh, I have some feedback, but I had um, not in the US, in Saudi Arabia, it was a system called Oasis in Najran, um, and also my friend has uh, used Oscar in Canada. So it seems like every country li likes to use something different. Um, yes. And this non-standardization makes it difficult to communicate between different hospitals, different institutions, and different countries. Right. All right, yeah. So we'll see how it goes. There are some... Uh... The problem is the uh, ones who develop the EMR are not physicians. So they look at it from technical uh, point of view and the physicians, they don't have the time to go into the technical part. So excellent. Thank you for sharing. If no other questions, we can go to the next uh, part. Any updates as far as your projects, guys, or anything uh, you want to share, ideas. Uh, I know Abir and her team presented uh, congratulations at the MA uh, a few days ago. And then I know also Tahani and her team, uh, they got one paper 
published and uh, curious. So congratulations to you guys. That's a good work. Excellent. Anyone else? I know uh, next month uh, one group is going to present at a meeting in Arizona. A poster. If nothing else, uh, I can just share with you the screen for next meeting. So um, our next meeting will have some agenda. Hopefully the team leader and the team members will work on this. If you have questions, please let me know and I can help you. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, see you next week. Thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for moderating this uh, Zoom meeting and thank you for the presenters and uh, who attended and uh, for those who didn't, uh, thank you for uh, watching the recorded video. We'll see you next week, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Nath. Have a good day. You too. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Dr. Nath. Thank you, Dr. Nath. Thank you, Dr. Nath. Thank you, Dr. Nath. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, so much, Dr. Nath. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Nath. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nath. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Dr. Everyone. Nath, everybody. Thank you, Reham. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Shema, for everything. Yes, Dr. Nader, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day, everyone.